All right, we're about to dive in into Tony Robbins saying some crazy things about Scripture, about God, about his opinion of who God is. And listen, I appreciate Tony Robbins. He's got some cool things to say about mental health. He's helped a lot of people in regards to that. But this is so terrible, and it's leading people astray. And I, I just want to compare what he is saying versus what God is saying about himself and his revealed through the scriptures. Uh, so let's just dive into this. It's it's kind of crazy. And it, it has to do with a story between him and his son and yada, yada, yada. About the Bible, I don't know if you agree with it or not, but I'll, I'll share it with you from my perspective. One of my sons, um, when he finally found Christ, he, you know, a lot of people, when they find God in whatever form they find God, they believe that they have found the way and everyone else should do it that way, right? Okay, first of all, he talks about how when my son found God, everyone thinks that they found the way. So first of all, when you find Jesus, you actually have found the way. In John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So that, that is a clear telling of, of the way. Uh, so either there has to be a way or there is no way. Because all these religions, they don't point to the same thing. I know people like to think that, oh, yeah, all religions believe the same. No, they don't believe the same thing. They actually believe something completely different. Uh, so uh, anyway, let's, let's keep going here. And his way was kind of hellfire and damnation at the time, right? And Okay, so his way is hellfire and damnation. Yes, I, I believe that sometimes that we like to, uh, you know, you're going to hell and you're going to hell. I, I don't agree with that. But let's let's be honest with the scriptures. Um, when we see scriptures uh, like in Revelation 22, this is the end of the scriptures. Um, in, in verse 12, Jesus says, look, I am coming. Soon, my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. So you're going to be repaid for your work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes. In other words, have been justified and have been clean. So they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by its gates. Talking about the heavenly city. Outside are the dogs the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Walking in a wrong religion, in a false religion, in a demonic religion is walking in falsehood. And so as much as Jesus is loving and loves all people at the same time, uh, only those that have accepted Christ and have been justified by faith are the ones that are going to enter through the gates. It's not those that, well, they lived a good life. No, 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 no. We have not lived a good life. And so, yeah, uh, I don't think we should tell everyone, hey, uh, uh, you know, you did this wrong, you're going to hell. It's not about doing this wrong, this wrong or that wrong. It's about have you actually found the truth and the way and have you accepted Christ? Yeah, I'm Christian myself, right? So it's like he's lecturing me. This is blowing my mind, right? Well, so one day I was in a Fiji, I have a resort there and a time there. And I was with my wife and I was like, you know, I'm not going to influence my son by talking about this. I said, I need to read the whole Bible from beginning to end. I want to do it over the next four or five days. I want to go on a fast, which is what I did. Amen. And I fasted and read the entire Bible in five days. My wife will tell you, no bullshit. Read the whole That's thing. pretty awesome, Everybody. actually. Everyone should and do that. It's quite a read. But when you well, read some might say the best in the world. <laughs> you know, you like, sold a lot of books. <laughs> but my man, <laughs> Jesus Christ, book. is a little heavier than you, bro. <laughs> yeah. well, I love the Old Testament and the New okay, Testament. I don't care what nobody says. George can be, he can be kind of funny. <laughs> he said, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, Bible, best-selling book of all time. Facts. Let's so go. Rainbow, Let's go. Thing, right? And one thing struck me that I thought was really interesting, and I went to my son with this because he was so locked up. He's not like that now. He's much more. It's like I hate it. You know, I often tell people the worst thing about Christians sometimes is Christians. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Christ was not a Christian. You know, we've made this whole thing up yeah, here. We like we were, this is how it is, right? That's why we need my son grace. Coming like that. I didn't want that. But at the same time, you're, you're so accurate with that, man. Like <laughs> when I when I was speaking about Jesus, I, I made a joke to my mom. I go, the only people that come at me are G are Jesus lovers. Like Muslims <laughs> are like, I'm so proud of you. Jewish people are like, I respect you. Christians <laughs> yeah. are like, nah. That's I'm why, like, what? They all got their judgment. How it should be. What should be right as if they've had the you know direct communication so anyway i went to my side after I whoa, whoa, whoa look look what he says here he says uh everyone has their own way of christianity as if they have a direct form of communication okay uh so we actually do have a direct form of communication it's called the word of god aka the scriptures that jesus affirmed um he said the scriptures would testify about me jesus affirmed uh the inspired word of god uh second timothy 3 16 through 17 all scripture is god breathed or inspired by god and is profitable for teaching 
for rebuking, for instruction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may complete, mature for every good work. Uh, so yeah, uh, actually, we do have a direct communication with God. It is through the scriptures and also through the Holy Spirit's leadings, but we measure the Holy Spirit's promptings and leadings according to the scriptures. The, God's word is the foundation. So yes, we actually all have a direct communication with God. It's not just for the uh, special elite Christians. It's through the scriptures. And if you understand God's word, well, now you begin to understand who really, uh, who God is. This whole thing. And I thought a lot about it. And I said, you know, honey, I said, I just read the whole Bible from cover to cover. He's like, no. And my wife's there. She goes, he did day and night in Fiji, five days, eat pineapple, watermelon and drank water. That was it. That was, he fasted the entire time. I said, it was a wild journey. Fasting. I said, it was beautiful. I said, and a couple things, that, uh, you know, kind of came to me. I said, the first thing that came to me is God seems like a selfish bastard in the first half of that book. I said, he's mean, he's jealous, he's spiteful. Okay. God is a jealous, I'm not even going to repeat the words that he just said. God. Okay. Psalm 1, 1 through 2. How blessed, how happy is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of mockers or scoffers. Okay. Uh George in that moment is sitting in the seat of a man who is actively mocking God. Galatians 6-7 specifically says, don't be, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap. So you're calling God a jealous, I'm not even going to repeat it. And what's crazy about that too is we see, yes, God is jealous in the scriptures. We see that. But he's not, he's jealous for you. Like, he's jealous for you. He's not jealous just to be jealous as some immature emotion. No, no, it's, it's the great love that he has for us, for the people of God, which is why he is jealous. And God repays evil for evil in the Old Testament. Let's find that back. He's mean, he's jealous, he's spiteful. I said, that's not my experience of God. And maybe the second half of the Bible. Okay, so and he's also spiteful. So spiteful is almost making like uh, malicious comments. So he's saying that God is, is is spiteful, but we actually see that that God is repaying evil for evil. The reason that people don't understand why God acts like he does in the Old Testament is because they don't think that sin is a big deal. Well, if you don't think sin is a big deal, then of course, any time that God acts in a certain kind of way, you're going to... You're going to think God is vindictive or spiteful. But if, as Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, the payment for sin is death, the fact that anyone sins and is not obliterated off the face of the planet just proves God's grace. Think about that. It proves God's grace, the fact that when you walk in sin, God doesn't smite you with a lightning bolt and just obliterate you off the planet. Actually, God said that to Adam and Eve in Genesis 1, um, we're actually going through the Bible study, going through Genesis, he talks about how you eat of the tree and you will surely die. But the showing of God's grace is the fact that they actually ate of the tree and they didn't die right away. Yes, they died eventually, but in that moment, God could, could have wiped them off the face of the planet. That is a picture of of God's grace. Everyone can experience, and also he, he's talking about how it's only for certain people. Everyone can experience God's grace in the Old Testament. Um, we actually see Gentiles being grafted in to the chosen people of God. If you actually read the lineage of Jesus, a lot of those people, read the Gospel of Matthew, the first chapter. A lot of those uh, people mentioned are Gentiles that have been grafted in by God's uh, great love and grace. Let's continue on. The New Testament is like God is it's not just about one, it's everybody, and everyone can experience this joy and this love. And I said, so, I said, I got a question for you. Because he was like, this is what the Bible says. And rather than saying, look, the Bible has been translated by men, <laughs> a group of Romans that may decide what went in and what went out. And we found missing pieces of the Bible, right? all that stuff. I just simply... Okay, look, look at all these statements. He just, he is like smuggling into this conversation where he don't, you don't even have time to even respond to them. He, you know, real quickly, just going to mention the fact that, you know, it's a group of Romans that translated the Bible and, uh, you know, and missing pieces and yada, yada, yada. Like, all these things are just blatantly false. 
Like, it wasn't a group of Romans. It was early church fathers in the Council of Nicaea that unanimously decided which was what were the scriptures, what were, was already affirmed by the early church. It's not some surprise. It's not some crazy thing. And, and he's talking about missing pieces of the Bible. What, do you, what are we talking about here? Missing pieces? We have over 5,000 manuscripts, original manuscripts of the Greek and Hebrew um, where we can reconstruct the scriptures to over a 99% certainty. It's not like we're just guessing here. No, no, no. It is, we are with certainty what the Bible is trying to communicate. There might be some prepositions or, or, or little tiny connected words like a and the and was or whatever, but none of it changes the meaning of the scriptures. We know what the scriptures teach. And so whatever he's talking about, a group of Romans or church father or, or um, uh, missing pieces, and but he just smuggles them in in this conversation without even a chance to, to even contemplate. But let, let's continue on what he says. Dad, do you think God grows? And he looked at me and said, what are you, what are you saying? Is this, is this a technique? I said, it's not a technique. I said, it's a simple question. Because I read the first line of the Bible, and God seems very selfish and spiteful and mean. Mm. And the second part, totally, completely loving. So I said, everything in the universe grows or dies. He goes, well, God knows what's going to happen, what's going to happen, he knows your thoughts. I said, I'll buy all that. But my question is not that. My que he goes, well, then you're saying it doesn't mean the same thing as the words. I said, no. I just said, does God grow? Okay. Let me answer that question. No. God does not grow. God specifically says, we see that in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, because I, the Lord, have not changed, you descendants of Jacob have not been destroyed. In other words, I, uh, because I am faithful and steadfast in who I am, and I keep my promises, even though you guys have fallen into sin, because I am such a gracious God, you're still alive. I haven't destroyed you. Or Hebrews 13, 8, this is my favorite one. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And you're like, well, where is Jesus Christ in the Bible? Well, we see or in the New Te in the Old Testament. We see uh, John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Colossians 1, 15 through 17, talks about all things were created in him and through him and by him. So Jesus is part of the Godhead, the creator of all things. Yes, he does not change. Or I should say, no, he does not change. And so I, I don't know what... Uh, all of these things that Tony Robbins is saying here, and, and I feel bad for his son because his son is just trying to follow the scriptures, um, and, and it's a shame. Now, now, he makes a great point here. We're going to see in a second. He makes a good point here. He really thought about it for a little bit. And I said, because my concern is your experience of God is through a minister, which I think it's a beautiful thing, but I'd love it if you'd had a direct experience of God, and that was what you're making judgments from rather than what somebody else told you. I'd love to have you. Okay, I completely agree with this. You should, this is the importance of discernment. You should not be basing your experience of the scriptures, experience of God, based off someone's interpretation of the scriptures. That's how people become deceived. You get these people that are being deceived because they don't know the word of God. They don't, they can't discern properly. And so they're just following into sin and temptation and all of these, uh, just being led astray. And that's because they haven't really read the Bible for themselves. So I, I agree with him here. If you have not read the scriptures, that's why we're diving into the Bible study. Um, get into God's word so you can discern truth from error. He's saying all these things, and if you don't know the word of God, you're just assuming that they're true. But, but obviously, when you compare them to the scriptures, they're not. They're not true. That's why it's so important to know God's word, because that's God, God's communication to us. Yes, we do have a communication line, line to God that same Bible and see what your experience of it is rather than someone telling you what it means through their filters. I agree. And that's the only thing I wish. I wish everybody's experience of God, quite frankly, was as unique as your signature. So instead of fighting over, you have to have my signature, everybody wanted to have their own individual signature, their own individual connection with God. That's the connection that I personally experience in the way I perceive God. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I don't try to make other people to be a certain way or my way is or somebody else's way is. I just want them to experience the joy of knowing that they're not alone and that they're made of something way more than their intellect and their ego. I love that you challenge your son. And okay, so let's kind of uh, bookend here. This he he talks about this statement about um, having your own experience of God. We should have our own signature, and and that sounds so pretty and nice. But the point that he's saying is is that your experience of God is predicated on what you feel. And I don't know about you, but our feelings change. I don't know about you, but my feelings change. Sometimes I'm just not feeling it. 
And so if I'm having a bad day, my experience of God might change. I might not trust the Lord anymore. I might think he changes. Well, God, if you're not really caring for me in this situation, I, maybe you're not the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And so the issue with th this is, this is, this is, this is the worst part is the fact that you're trying to lead people to trust their own selves in their own version of truth and their own experiences over the scriptures. We don't interpret God by our own experience. We interpret God by his revelation. God's revelation through the word of God is how we discern our experiences. Because if not, you could maybe go on a little trip Maybe you're doing psychedelics and you have this experience and you think this is God, but in reality, it's actually the, the demonic because it does not point people to Jesus. It does not point you to Jesus. It points you away from him. And so uh, this is why when people say things about God, we need to know what he actually said. No, we should not go off of our own experience. No, God isn't some vindictive bully. God is a gracious, loving, steadfast God who does not change from the beginning of Genesis 1 all the way to the end of Revelation. He is gracious and merciful, but yes, he will cast judgment. His wrath will not be relinquished from those who have decided to reject his gift. They will pay for their sins. And so there are a lot of people out there that are going to listen to this and say, oh, man, that sounds so nice. But the truth is you need to know the word of God for yourself because that's not true. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is the truth. That is the way. And so let me say this. Our lives are not about us. It's not about David. It's not about you. It's all about Jesus and what he has said about himself. And if you got to the end of this video, I just want to say thank you for watching. Uh, my name is David Narvaez. I'm a missions and discipleship pastor uh, for Crossing Cultures International. We train, equip, and empower leaders and pastors all over the world. And the truth is, I cannot do what I do without people like you that partner with me. Um, if you made it this far and you enjoyed this video, like, comment, share. Um, in the description, there is an ability for you to partner with me and support uh, the ministry that I'm a part of. And uh, I'll see you all in the next one.